This is welcome to our spring 2020 undergraduate research virtual presentations. Under normal circumstances, this is one of the highlight event in our spring semester. But regardless of the difficulties, these three student researchers have done an outstanding job. Um, before our feature presentation, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. to invite Dr. Gray to deliver a speech for us. Dr. Gray. So it is the highlight, as I think I shared as I came on, it is the highlight of my semester because at the heart of all we do is helping you young students um, develop as, as future scholars and as citizens are gonna come back and make McHenry County great. So I'm excited to see what you have to offer. You don't know it yet, but if you think about the body of knowledge right now, we keep you inside that body of knowledge, teaching you all sorts of things in there. What you're laying the foundation for, the framework, the process you've gone through, as you go further with that, you're gonna explore something that just very slightly increases that body of knowledge. And so the work you're doing here in, in, in research projects like this really does um, it's what makes us understand who we are and how our world works much better. So it doesn't necessarily seem like that when you're down in the trenches looking at data and trying to find patterns and trying to see why that happened and what was it what we expected, but um, eventually you'll do it. And I think all of us that have published before probably felt the same way about our projects that you do right now. We're kind of, yeah, okay, we learned a little bit here and a little bit there, but other people that haven't been in those trenches get really excited about the work you created because you, you are indeed laying um, foundations that other people are gonna build upon. So I am excited. It is indeed one of my favorite things to kind of see, see nerdiness in action because I think at heart, we're all a little bit nerds. So thanks and congratulations on, on completing the semester and this great project. Thank you, Dr. Gray. I think now we are eager to see the presentation. Uh, our first presentation uh, will be Jessica Sound. And Marla, would you like to introduce the detail about that? I would love to introduce these students. Thank you, Holly. So um, Jessica Sound is, she was in my microbiology class last fall. And she came up to me at the end of the semester and asked if she could do a research project. And I said, well, why do you want to do a research project in microbiology? And she said, because I want to go on into food microbiology. And you, you have to know that does my heart so good to hear students say they want to pursue microbiology. And, and it's the odd student out that wants to do that. Most of our students want to go on into healthcare. But Jess was just like, no, I want to go into food microbiology. So she had an idea for a project. But we needed a little bit of input because it wasn't something I had ever done before. And Dale Morton, I know you guys know Dale Morton, he is on the foundation uh, board. And Dale is a retired vice president of PepsiCo. He worked at the Quaker Oats plant in Barrington as vice president for many, many years. And he was the vice president of food safety for the largest corporation in the world. So uh, we contacted Dale and we talked to him and he guided us and gave us a lot of initial advice. And so he really helped us get on track with Jess's project, which was really exciting because at that point we got to connect Jess with a real world food microbiologist. And she is planning on going, um, this coming fall, she's going to University of Wisconsin, Whitewater, where she will be pursuing a microbiology degree in uh, hopefully food science. She wants to specialize in that area. And so with no further ado, I would like to introduce to you one of the up and coming new microbiologists, Jessica Sound. Hello, my name is Jessica Sound, and I am so excited that I have gotten this opportunity not only to have been able to conduct undergraduate research alongside Marla and many others, but to also be able to present my findings to all of you. Thank you so much for being here to listen and possibly gain some knowledge on my research. I very much appreciate it. Before I begin, I would like, to ask, I would like you to ask yourself a question. Have you ever been cleaning out your refrigerator and come across a package of coffee? and wondered if it was still edible. How did you determine whether or not you were going to cook and consume it? Maybe you looked at the color of the ground beef or the texture, or did you look for the use-by date 
Sell by, used by, freeze by, and best if used by or before dates are determined by the manufacturers of the product based on recommendations from the United States Department of Agriculture, also known as the USDA. These dates signify when the product is of the highest quality. Food quality refers to the flavor, color, and texture of the food, and not at all how safe the product is to consume. The USDA has many techniques for making sure products are safe for consumers before they arrive at the store where they will be sold. The Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, is in charge of making sure that all packaging materials for food are safe and will not inflict danger on the consumer. So we know that the packaging methods used for ground beef are safe, but how do we know for certain that different packaging methods provide equivalent levels of quality? This experiment tested the difference in total aerobic cell count in two types of ground beef packaging to test the question of how do, we, how do different packaging methods of ground beef impact the growth of microbes as it ages past the cell by date. This question is one of the importance because if this study proves to show a significant difference in aerobic cell counts in the ground beef between the packaging types, then it would possibly advise consumers on the quality of the ground beef purchase. One of the met packaging methods in this experiment is ground beef based on a fungi wrapped in plastic, which was then heat fused to the bottom of the tray, creating an airtight package. The foam trays are made from expanded polystyrene, which is formed when foaming agents are added to polystyrene to powder dry. The other method used was butcher paper, which is an odorless, tasteless paper that is specially treated in groups. I wanted to be able to test the quality of ground beef in terms of color, flavor, and texture from the same stock between these two packaging methods. In order to test the bacterial cell count for these samples, I follow a protocol in the Bacteriological Analytical Manual, also known as BAM, for the frozen, chilled, pre-cooked, and prepared food. First, I purchased eight individually wrapped quarter pound samples of ground beef all from the same store, all taken on the same day, and from the same stockpile in the display cooler. Four of them were wrapped in butcher paper and four on foam trays. In addition, I asked the butcher to change their glove every time a sample was taken. Because of these guidelines, each of the eight packages had the same use by date. These samples were then transported to the lab in a cooler and immediately placed in a temperature controlled refrigerator. One day after the use by date, I retrieved one sample of ground beef in butcher paper and one sample on the foam trays from the refrigerator. Each time I sampled, I took 10 grams of ground beef and mixed it in the Butterfield's phosphate buffer and conducted a cereal dilution, then plated a one milliliter aliquot of each dilution onto 3M Petri film. 3M Petri film is a medium system that contains nutrients, a cold water soluble gelling agent and an indicator dye to make colonies easier to see. The Petri film was then incubated for 24 hours at 37 degrees Celsius. Under a dissecting microscope, I was able to count colonies. This process was repeated three, five, and seven days after the cell by date for each packaging method. I used an aerobic cell count approach for determining the number of bacteria present because this shows how many bacteria are in the ground beef and can live in the presence of oxygen. Aerobic cell counts do not differentiate between different species of bacteria, but are representative of the total number of bacterial cells present. Knowing the aerobic cell counts of the samples helped me to determine the quality of the ground beef, because as these counts increase, the quality of the ground beef decreases. The results from this experiment were at first rather shocking to me because there was a very noticeable difference in the initial bacterial cell count in the ground beef wrapped in butcher paper, which experienced an initial lag phase compared to the cell count in the ground beef on the foam trays with plastic wrap, which showed an initial decrease in cell count. Although the initial cell counts were so different on day five, there was a rapid growth in bacterial cell count in the ground beef for both of the packaging methods and by day seven, the final counts were virtually equivalent. Here's a graph of the aerobic cell count in ground beef as a function of time. On the y-axis, we have the aerobic cell count times 10,000, 
and on the x-axis, that is the number of days past the sell-by date. The yellow line on this graph represents the bacterial counts in 10 gram samples of ground beef wrapped in butcher paper. As you can see in the first couple of days past the sell-by date, there was almost no change in cell count. But as we move to five days past the sell-by date, we can see that the cell population begins to increase slightly. From five to seven days past the sell-by date, you see an almost logarithmic type of bacterial cell growth. The butcher paper wrapped samples actually seem very similar to the bacterial growth curve under ideal conditions. On the contrary, the purple line, which represents the bacterial counts in the ground beef on the foam trays, actually decreased from day one to day five post sell by date, which took me by surprise. I was expecting an increase in cell count and by Day five in this experiment, I was beginning to think that maybe due to the lack of oxygen in this type of packaging method, the cell counts would continue to decrease throughout the entirety of this experiment. However, as you can see, by day seven, the ground beef on the foam trays increased rapidly, ending with a cell count very similar to the ground beef wrapped in the butcher paper. Due to the course of this semester, I was unable to repeat this experiment in triplicate as was originally planned so that I could gather statistics on this data. And unfortunately, I only have this one set of data to show you. Nonetheless, I have some suspicions on what might have been going on in plastic wrap samples. Ultimately, there's no significant difference one week out from the cell by date between the different packaging methods. So what might be happening here? Although I was unable to gather statistics on my study to back this up, I think I have a pretty good going on here. The massive difference in initial cell count may be to the very way ground beef is manufactured. Let me explain. The surface microbes on the meat are ground into the muscle tissue and have a high risk of bac bacteria in some areas in comparison to other areas. In other words, these samples were potentially non-homogenized. The other possible explanation has to do with the fact that I was not able to conduct this experiment more than once before spring break and therefore could not generate statistical evidence. I would like to thank Kathleen Hennessy, Susan Britton, Sam Moran, Jordan Pierce, Tracy Chapman, Peter Lilly, Dale Morton, Holly Ray, and of course, Marla Garrison for making all of this possible and for providing me with the knowledge and resources I needed to conduct this undergraduate research. Once again, thank you all for being here today and listening to me and my fellow researchers. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Do you have, uh, does anybody have any questions for Jessica? I, I will say that um, these students, you guys, I just have to tell you that the three students that did undergraduate research this semester. Um, they were the finest that I have had in the course of all these. It's been almost a dozen years now. And, and I think that um, they, were, they were so adaptable to the way things went. They, their research got truncated because of COVID and they still rolled with it and they still thought about everything and did more research and wrote everything up. They have written up uh, scientific quality, jour uh, journal quality scientific articles, each and every one of them, as well as doing a presentation to a general audience. And, um, and while they, to begin with, before we began the research, they had to do an online um, laboratory safety course to be allowed to work individually unsupervised in the micro lab. Uh, I, I always say that, that confidence should only come with competence. And Jessica and Alyssa and Bella, they have the right to be extremely confident because their competence in the lab was second to none. I've never seen students that work so efficiently and, and so well by themselves in the lab and so uh, precisely. So Jessica was the first student I've ever had use the Petri film or do the aerobic plate count. She read about it, did it all on her own, and she, she did an outstanding job. She taught me how to work with aerobic plate counts. So that was, that was fantastic. So Holly, uh, Dr. Gray, are you able to stay for the whole thing? If not, I think we'll have Alyssa do her presentation next so that you, you hear another live live voice. Does that work? Okay. All right. Thank you. So the next, um, 
The next student I have the pleasure of introducing is Alyssa Heidenreich. And she was also a student of mine in microbiology last fall. And um, Alyssa is the second student that, that I've had in the past year that wanted to pursue, a, wants to pursue a degree in microbiology. Alyssa isn't so interested in food science. She is interested in agricultural microbiology. And she was all set to go out to the University of North Dakota and finish her bachelor's in microbiology, doing undergraduate research out there with some of their, um, their fine uh, faculty that work with microbes in, in livestock. She is unable to pursue that at the moment, so she has had to redo her, some of her plans. So she will be attending University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee to pursue her microbiology degree starting this fall. And, um, and she uh, has another side, side hobby besides microbiology, and she wanted to pair these two hobbies together. And I'm gonna let her tell you about this other hobby because um, after all of our pathogen talk last semester, she started getting a little bit concerned about one of her jobs. So I am going to introduce you to another confident, because she's competent, URSP student, Alyssa Hyden. I'd first like to start by thanking you again for joining us and for your time. I'm very excited to share with you what I found. Um, so to start again, my name is Alyssa Heidenreich and I also just finished my second year at MCC. Um, so outside of school, um, I ride horses. Um, I work at a horse barn and part of my job is to take care of the older and the sicker horses that are at our barn. Um, so I wanted to be able to combine these two passions of mine for microbiology and horses and kind of see what I could do with that. Um, so after I did some background research, um, I found that Staphylococcus aureus or Staph aureus is a bacteria in the normal flora of horses. Um, and it's also in the normal flora of humans and about one third to one half of the population. Um, so it's found in the nares or the nasal passages um, or any warm, salty, moist area of your body. And when it gets deep into your tissues, it can cause really nasty infections called staph infections, which I'm sure most everyone has heard of a staph infection. And staph aureus is the thing that causes that. Um, are my slides not working? Let's see. There we go. All right. Um, so the thing with Staph aureus is that it is found in both horses and humans, but it's also a zoonotic pathogen, which means that it can be crossed um, across animal species. So it can be transferred from horse to human and vice versa. Um, there are not many zoonotic bacteria, but Staph aureus is by far the number one that can be transferred. And as I was doing background research to see, you know, well, what would I want to study? Like, what would I want to look at? I wasn't able to find any study that actually surveyed air in a barn to see how prevalent Staph aureus was in the air. So I figured, well, great, I'll do that with my research. I will see, I will survey the air at my barn and see what it's like. Um, and a shocking study that I had found actually determined that about 13% of horse handlers or anyone who's in close contact with horses um, was colonized by methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA, which is really like a super bug that's resistant to most everything. And the normal colonization rate of just the general human population is about 2%. So you're almost seven times more likely to be colonized by it if you're working with horses, which just further showed that this needs to be something that needs to be analyzed and researched. So when I was collecting samples, I wanted a medium that would only grow staphylococci because there's so much present in the air at a barn. Um, so I needed to be very selective with what would grow on my medium. So I use mannitol salt auger, which has a very high salt concentration at 7.5%, which inhibits the growth of most bacteria. Most things cannot grow on it except for staphylococci. 
and I needed a way to differentiate between what was growing on these plates. So I had two carbon sources that were added to this. The first one is mannitol, which is a sugar alcohol, and peptone, which is a protein. And so if the staff that grows on the plate utilizes the mannitol, it goes through through fermentation, which produces acids, while if the staff is unable to use this mannitol, it uses the other carbon source, the peptone, and it respires ammonia, which is basic. And so to determine if the staff was fermenting acids or using uh, the peptone, a phenol red acid base indicator was used. And so I don't have a plate or a picture of a inoculated plate, but mannitol starts out as this very like bright red auger. And so you can see in the top photo, um, the plate was struck with Staphylococcus epidermidis, which um, produces ammonia, so it's basic, and it turns this auger a hot pink color. Whereas if it's struck with Staph aureus, it turns this very bright yellow color because it produces acids. So after these plates were made, they were set out at various locations, which are indicated by the white dots on that schematic there. Um, and a bit about the barn that I used, um, it's located in West Dundee, Illinois, and it, it uh, covers an area of 1,325 square meters, so it's a fairly large barn. Um, and there is a large door located at both ends of the front aisle, a large garage door located at the front of the ring, and then a door located at the back end of that back aisle. So this is important because during the summer, these doors are completely open and there's a ton of fresh air that's circulating through. But during the winter, these doors are completely closed, minus a few exceptions, just to bring supplies in and out. Um, and so it creates this very closed system with not a lot of fresh air that's able to come in. And there's also a bit of a lack in the HVAC system at this barn because it doesn't pull fresh air in from the outside to heat it. It simply circulates air that's already in the barn, heats it, and then sends it back out. So you have no fresh air coming in that way. So these plates that were set out at these locations, they were left open only after the last person had left to create this closed system. And they were left out for 12 hours overnight. And then when I collected them, I brought them back and they were incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. And my plates turned out as so. So the initial results from these plates were very shocking to say the least. I did not expect to get really any bacteria to grow, let alone this number of solid yellow plates. I ended up having six of my 20 plates that were solid yellow, six that were mostly yellow, and six that were mostly red, but they had some yellow, and only three of them were solid red, indicating that there was no presence of anything that could be Staph aureus. So when you did the math, it turned out that about 85% of my plates contained colonies that looked suspicious of Staph aureus. So then I went ahead and I collected 30 colonies from these plates and I chose them based on um, the looks. So the colonies had to be round and bright gold and yellow with these yellow zones around them. And just to confirm that I was indeed collecting um, staphylococci, I looked at them under the microscope um, and I did a gram stain to ensure that they were gram positive and that they showed the morphology that I was looking for under the microscope. And so all 30 that I had collected did show this uh, staphylococcal morphology. So then they were struck for isolation on fresh plates and I performed a coagulase test on them. So coagulase is an enzyme that is produced that clots plasma in blood, which is considered a very significant sign of virulence because once it enters into the body, this bacteria can basically wall itself off from your immune system and it allows it to grow very rapidly and cause very serious infections. And Staph aureus is considered a pathogen because it's able to produce coagulase. So these 30 clinical isolates were then inoculated into little vials of rabbit plasma. And it came back that 27 out of the 30 isolates that I had collected showed mild clotting. So Staph aureus produces significant solid clots. So it's possible that the isolates that I had were not exactly Staph aureus. However, since they did show a mild positive, it's possible that they could have been um, Staphylococcus delphini, Staphylococcus intermedius, and Staphylococcus pseudo-intermedius. 
And these ones do not produce as significant clots as Staph aureus. So these 27 coagulase positive isolates were then tested for antibiotic resistance, which um, the image on the right there are my plates for the antibiotic susceptibility testing. So of my 27 clinical isolates, seven of them showed resistance to penicillin, and those same seven also showed intermediate resistance to tetracycline. Now, none of these isolates were cefoxitin resistant, which is important because cefoxitin is now used in place of methicillin since methicillin is no longer produced. So none of these um, isolates can be classified as methicillin resistant or MRSA. So overall, I cannot confirm that these isolates that I collected were staph aureus just due to the loose clots and the little antibiotic resistance that was shown. Um, at this time, staph aureus is resistant to almost all antibiotics, especially in animals because of the really overuse of antibiotics in veterinary medicine. I mean, it is a good thing that the bacteria that I collected were not resistant to a lot of things because that would be very alarming. Um, but again, what was alarming was just how much staph that I had collected on these 20 plates. Um, I only sampled 30 isolates. However, I could have literally taken hundreds and hundreds of isolates and could have done tons of tests, but just due to a lack of time and resources in our current situation, I just wasn't able to. Um, and again, because of time, I was only able to go through this experiment once, so I'm not able to present statistics. Um, but going along, if I had been able to move forward with this experiment um, and do further testing, I would have grown these isolates on Baird Parker egg yolk telluride auger, which would definitively confirm if Staph aureus was what I had. And then I would also send these isolates out for genetic testing for the catalase gene to distinguish between the possible um, other coagulase positive species that these could be. Um, from these results, I feel that we need to promote better designs and layouts for barns um, to optimize better airflow, to make sure that more air is flowing through these barns. So that way you don't get this stagnant, stale air that is just rife with bacteria. Um, and I would also like to suggest that those with active infections or those with underlying pathologies would actually consider wearing PPE while working in close contact with horses since there is such a large amount of staph that is present in this air um, with the risk of possible transmission. Um, so to close, I would just like to thank everyone who helped me along the way with this project, Kathleen Hennessy, Susan Britton, Sam Moran, Jordan Pierce, Tracy Champion, Peter Lilly, Holly Wright, and of course Marla Garrison. She's been an amazing mentor throughout all of this, and I've had an amazing time with her in this research. Thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. That was outstanding. You can see why my, if I was wearing a, be, a vest, my buttons would be bursting off of it. I am so proud of these young women. And to, to, um, to finish this off, we have Isabella Persino. Bella is, um, she is not able to make it today. She had something that was unavoidable come up. So what she did is she pre-recorded her presentation. She put it on YouTube. Holly, do you have that available to go? Okay. And so Holly's going to bring it up. But I did want to tell you about Isabella as well, because it was a big, huge disappointment to her that she could not be here with Jess and Alyssa. They are three buddies, and they are three peas in a pod. They are all outstanding. And Bella, um, Bella's research is kind of interesting. We did have to go through the IRB approval for it because she used human subjects. Um, but she actually struck the belly buttons of 100 biology students, and she was looking to see whether or not the belly button could be a hideout for Staphylococcus aureus and future, future staph infections, because um, as you know, when you go into the hospital and they want to see if you are a carrier for staph, they simply swab your external nares, which are the outer nostril, and they streak it, and if you're not, they say, if they're not there, they say, oh, you're not a carrier. And that's actually not true. You can find staph in a lot of different places on the body. I won't tell you where because it's a little off color, <laughs> but the, the belly button is a place that has never been thoroughly checked as a possible um, hiding place. She looked at it and she said, you know what? 
decolonization of staph carriers is very difficult. They can spray your nose, they can get rid of MRSA in your nose, but it doesn't mean it's not somewhere else in your body and it's going right back. So she thought, aha, the belly button might be a source of recolonization for, for carriers after we clean out their noses. And that may be why decolonization of staph is so difficult to do on carriers, on persistent carriers. So I'll just set it up with that. She is attending. She's already admitted to University of Wisconsin at Madison for the fall. She has her apartment ready to go. She will be completing a bachelor's. Um, and then she's moving into physician's assistant school. So um, that is Bella's plan. And uh, Holly, I'll just let you start it up. Hi everyone, I'm Bella Persino, one of the undergraduate microbiology researchers for 2020, and I wanted to make this video that, so that I could share my research with everyone and the information I discovered throughout this process. So I took microbiology last year with Marla Garrison, and we worked lots with the bacterium Staphylococcus aureus. This bacterium is actually considered normal human skin flora in over one third of the adult population and it's known to colonize the nasal cavity, perineum, axillae, and other warm, moist, salty body regions of carriers. However, upon entering deeper tissues, it becomes a significant opportunistic pathogen and is a leading cause of infections worldwide. Decolonization of Staph aureus carriers has been challenging. I knew that the umbilical region is a similar environment to other regions of the body staph colonizes, making it a perfect hideout for staph in a region of recolonization. So that's when I came to Marla with the question, how abundant are staph aureus umbilical carriers? Also, of those carriers, what's the prevalence of methicillin-resistant staph aureus, also known as MRSA? So throughout the course of two weeks during the semester, I asked 100 volunteers to swab their own navels with a pre-moistened sterile cotton swab, and that swab was immediately struck onto mantle salt auger, which is a selective and differential media, meaning that it allows growth of some bacteria while inhibiting the growth of others. It's selective because it only allows gram-positive bacteria, which is one of two categories, categories of bacteria, um, grow on this auger, and it's differential because when Staph aureus is present, um, the strain of staph will ferment the mannitol and produce an acidic byproduct, turning the pH indicator in the agar a bright yellow color. With my plates that I had questionable colonies, I gram stained the bacteria of the colony and looked underneath the microscope to make sure that I was seeing perfect purple grape-like clusters of bacteria, indicating staph and making sure that it wasn't just a false positive. So I actually ended up with 17 mannitol positive plates and with these confirmed, with them all being confirmed staphylococci, I made pure culture plates um, that then would be used further. So on the left here, I have a picture of staph epidermidis, which is a normal skin flora. And then in the middle, I have another sample plate that has some of those smooth yellow colonies indicating that it could be staph aureus and then here on the right i have a picture of a pure culture plate the next step i did was take some bacteria from each of the 17 pure culture plates and put each one in rabbit plasma the reason i did this is because staph aureus produces a protein called coagulase and this causes fibrin formation also known as a clot which this is actually one of the reasons why staph aureus can be so dangerous and it's one of its virulence factors. Out of these 17 tentative staph aureus samples, 11 of them showed strong clotting. So at this point, I knew I had at least 11% of my population sample size that are staph aureus carriers. And the reason I say at least is because I'm only counting the most virulent bacteria that had the strongest clotting. But however, there also were other samples that did not have, or they did have weak to moderate clotting. So when we're looking at these pictures here on the left side, there's a co coagulase negative um, control. And then uh, on the right side, there's a coagulase positive control and you can see that clot. And then on the right side, there's also a picture of a coagulase positive sample. 
After finding 11 Staph aureus samples, I then wanted to see if any of them were MRSA, which again is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And what MRSA really is, is it's kind of like a superbug version of Staph aureus. It carries a gene that allows it to be resistant to a whole class of beta-lactam antibiotics, and when someone has MRSA, they often have to resort to another form of treatment like vancomycin. When testing for MRSA using the clinical laboratory standards, I found that 11 out of those 11 Staph aureus carriers, one was actually a carrier of MRSA. Overall, this study is the first of its kind to show the umbilical region as a potential refugium for Staph aureus and helps to explain the clinical lack of success in decolonizing persistent Staph aureus carriers. I also showed that MRSA strains can colonize the umbilicus and therefore this study strongly refutes the idea that decolonization of the nasal cavity of patients alone is an effective means of reducing the cause or transmission of staph in a clinical setting. Lastly, I would really just love to thank for their support and assistance throughout this research, Kathleen Hennessy, Susan Britton, Sam Moran, Jordan Pierce, Tracy Chapman, Peter Lilly, and Holly Ray. And I would especially love to thank Marla Garrison for being my partner and guide throughout this research. I really did have so much fun and I really enjoyed contributing to the body of knowledge and science. And hopefully I can build off this research at UW-Madison. Thank you. And there to conclude our the last presentation. Um, what a wonderful job. I'm so delighted. It's truly amazing to see those. Um, at this moment, actually, it just occurred to me, we have three female researchers and female scientists. So wonderful. And I'd like to actually invite Dr. Maria Tatum to say some, to share some words of wisdom for our students and also for us as they go up to college. You know, as a dean of, um, as dean of the math and sciences and a scholar in the science field. Please. Sure, thanks Holly. So Alyssa and Jess and Bella wasn't here, but Marla, you can pass it on. Those were really um, excellent presentations. And um, and especially it's, it's hard in research to, to say something when you didn't get to do all of your experiment. So I think uh, you've met that challenge um, admirably well, right? To be able to say, I was able to do uh, some of it what I wanted to do and, and here's what I can draw from that. And also just um, wish you really well. I, um, so I'm a chemist by training and I can just tell you that the sciences can take you um, really amazing places. Um, I, I got to go and do research in Germany. I worked with teams in China and in Russia and got to travel both those places as well. As well. So you may wanna do things like that, you may not, but, um, but there are really uh, incredible possibilities. Um, so finish your bachelor's and um, if you're already doing research, um, maybe that will mean you wanna go on to a, to a doctorate and, um, and that's a, it's a great opportunity. So best of luck to you and really nice work. Very impressive. Thank you. God pride ladies, awesome work. Yay. And um, any questions for them? I have, let me check on the chat. I, I just wanted to thank um, Holly and Tracy. You guys were amazing. And thank you so much for helping us um, amidst uh, a little bit of chaos this semester. And, um, and thank you, Dr. Gray and Maria for always, you guys always support this research. And I can't tell you how important, I, I have seen it be in the lives of students as a stepping stone. And to, to just, doesn't it just do your heart good and give you hope for the future to see such articulate, intelligent, um, young, committed young women doing this? It wouldn't matter, young women, young men, it's just so um, promising and optimistic. In a time when we need a little optimism, I think these three students really, really show that, that the future can be brighter. Truly really amazing. And Alyssa and Jess, do you have anything to say? I mean, just thank you for everyone for coming. I mean, it was really cool to get to actually share what I did with all of you. So thank you for, for coming. <laughs> okay, at this moment, I would like you, if you please unmute yourself and you show your face if you can. I would like you to have a round of applause for our three outstanding students, Paula and Casey Chang, for your support. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And stay safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. Great job, everybody. Nice Good job. job. Yeah. Wonderful. Bye-bye.